I'm so glad to be speaking with you again. And I've been doing so many conventions over the past year and a half. So any of you who have heard this spiel before, I apologize. Um, then you'll realize, you know, some of the jokes aren't as funny the second time. But I also tend to go off script a lot. So there will be something new, even if you have uh, heard this before. Because I'm very infamous for just going off on, on some rabbit trails. And I do have to take on and off my glasses because you know, I'm 50 now and that's what happens. I ran out of white paper home, so they're kind of blue. All right, uh, that was a wonderful introduction. I like to give a little bit more detail sometimes. I am the current Region 1 representative, and I always have to do this in alphabetical order. It's funny. You think after two years I'd remember the states that I represent. But it's Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Hawaii, Kansas, Montana, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming. I think that's the fastest I ever, I ever did that. <laughs> and it's been a, a great pleasure to represent them. As most of you know, I am now currently running for LNC Secretary. And I have to tell you, the most painful thing was to decide not to rerun for Region 1. I love working with affiliates, and I particularly love my nine states. And it's and that's how I view my nine states. So if, the, if my successor does not do a good job, I will. Um, violate the nap. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, yes, I used to be communications director with the Libertarian Party of Colorado. My husband is the chair of the Libertarian Party of Colorado. I think he became involved to see me, and then I got a little boring trick on him, so he went and got involved in his chair and then resigned from the Libertarian Party of Colorado. So now he goes to the meetings and then I'm not there, but he, he really loves it. He's going to be running for town council and winning later this year. Uh, I'm also, as you know, that it will become relevant to this talk, the chair of the Libertarian Party Historical Preservation Committee, and I'm also on the Advertising Publication and Review Committee. Yes, you can blame me for the um, Church of Satan post on um, Holy Week. Sorry. Well, it, it happens. You, you, you can blame me for that one. So, a little bit of background I gave you guys last night. Um, those of you who heard it last night, sorry, you can hear it again because not everyone was here last night. I became, a, and it's relevant to my speech, I became a libertarian in a way, whoa, in a way that many people don't. You know, everyone has their own unique story, but oftentimes it's, you know, a libertarian friend or you read some libertarian books. That didn't happen with me at all. I hated politics. I actually still do hate politics quite intensely, but I hated politics. I didn't vote. I had absolutely zero interest. But I was involved in an evangelical Christian church. And if any of you know, it was Calvary Chapel. I don't know how popular that is out here, but in Florida it was really big. And if any of you know that movement, it's very it's very tied into politics. So if you were in that movement, if you were a Christian, you were a Republican, and that is just the way it was. It was right there after the Trinity. So I got into it a little bit with, in that way. So I switched my, my registration from Democrat to Republican when I, when I joined that church. But I, never, I was a rhino. I didn't do too much. But I used to like to debate a lot. And I was debating with some Christian friends on Facebook, and this is horrifying in and of itself, though, but it was a debate over homeless people and whether or not we should put spikes under overpass bridges to keep the homeless people from sleeping there. And, you know, heretic, I said no. And they were, they were aghast, and, and they called me a libtard and various other names. And at that time, being called a liberal, I mean, you would might as well have just, like, called me literally Hitler. I was extremely upset, so I pulled out what I call an ass fact, which is a fact you just pull out of your ass. <laughs> well, I've done that. And I said, no, 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 I'm not a liberal, I'm more of a libertarian. Because I figured, I don't know what that means, but I don't think they knew what that meant either, and it got me out of that debate. But I figured afterwards that I should probably probably know what it means, so I went to LP.org and I read the platform. Not really the entire platform, I read the Statement of Principles and the Preamble, and I closed that browser tab, went to the Secretary of State of Colorado and switched my voter registration on the spot. Within a period of 10 minutes, I went from nothing to libertarian. <laughs> So my, my poor husband, you know, we met online, you know, we're one of those modern couples, and he, 
he met this you know very quiet conservative non-political christian girl and then he came home to something different and all of a sudden i was like he's like i switched my voter registration he's like oh boy you don't even vote <laughs> and i gave him the story and i guess it would have ended right there probably i would have maybe started voting and then it was the t-shirt and it got it went down from there and i got involved with the local party also because i moved from florida and I came out to Colorado and I work from home and we don't realize how many friends we make at work. So I've been here almost a year and knew nobody. And my husband was very concerned. He's like, you ought to meet people. You ought to get involved in something. Now he's really regretting that. <laughs> very much so. So that's kind of how I got involved with the LP Colorado because I wanted to meet people and get involved with something. And he forgot that I have severe OCD. So here we go. <laughs> And ever since that conversion experience, that come to Jesus experience, I've always remembered what it felt like when I read those words, because actually it was just that, that that convinced me. Obviously, I must have had those leanings, you know, all along, but they really, really spoke to me, and that's kind of been my obsession since then. And that leads directly to where I am here. I decided that I wanted to look more into those words that so deeply moved me and quite literally changed my, changed my life. Get my, my old lady glasses on again so I don't make sure, so I make sure you're on my own way too off track. Okay, so what I have here, and I do have this, I, can, I know, you won't believe it, maybe you will. Um, I've got this banner and multiple other banners of the statement of principles up at my house. It's like a shrine. Uh, it's quite lovely. But, <laughs> I don't know if my husband thinks so, but I definitely think so. So it was basically these words. The, these words that revolutionized at least my political life, but I also think my personal, moral, ethical life as well. And what I would ask everyone to do, well, before I get started, I know some of you are thinking, this is going to be really, really boring, historical, boring, boring, awful, boring, boring. And for some of you, it might be, I'm sorry. But I think most of you are going to walk away from here with a renewed appreciation for the history of our party. You will definitely learn something, and there'll be at least one or two people. There was a gentleman, I don't know if he's in the room right now, who came and spoke to me earlier because he heard me speak in New Hampshire and said it almost brought him to tears. And it does, this information can affect some people that way. And I hope at least to put a little bit of the fire I have in my belly in your belly. Because if one thing I am, it's passionate about this party. I might not be right a lot of the time, but if one thing I am is passionate about this party, I don't think anyone can take that away from me. So what I would like you to do is just listen to the statement of principles. We read things. But something we have forgotten in our very literate culture, unlike more primitive cultures, is the power of the spoken word. The spoken word is way different than the written word. It speaks to you in a different place. I'm sure all of you have read the Statement of Principles. I'm not so sure any of you have ever heard it spoken aloud. So you're going to get a little bit of reading time here. It's up here, but I will read it to you. I'm going to ask you to really pay attention. It says, we, the members of the Libertarian Party, challenge the cult of the omnipotent state and defend the rights of the individual. We hold that all individuals have the right to exercise sole dominion over their own lives and have the right to live in whatever manner they choose, so long as they do not forcibly interfere with the equal right of others to live in whatever manner they choose. Wait, flip this. Governments throughout history have regularly operated on the opposite principle, that the state has the right to dispose of the lives of individuals and the fruits of their labor. Even within the United States, all political parties other than our own grant to government the right to regulate the lives of individuals and seize the fruits of their labor without their consent. We, on the contrary, deny the right of any government to do these things and hold that where governments exist, they must not violate the rights of any individual, namely, the right to life. Accordingly, we support the prohibition of the initiation of physical force against others. The right to liberty of speech and action. Accordingly, we oppose all attempts by government to abridge the freedom of speech and press, as well as government censorship in any form, and the right to property. Accordingly, we oppose all government interference with 
private property, sorry, such as confiscation, nationalization, and eminent domain, and support the prohibition of robbery, trespass, fraud, and misrepresentation. Since governments, when instituted, must not violate rights, we oppose all interference by the government in the areas of voluntary and contractual relations amongst individuals. People should not be forced to sacrifice their lives and property for the benefit of others. They should be left free by the government to deal with one another as free traders. And the resultant economic system, the only one compatible with the protection of individual rights, is the free market. Now, that was penned in 1971. Quite a, quite a bit of time ago, and to us that's old hat. But try to remember back to your status days, we've all had them, right? Except for Nick, he's he second generation libertarian, but most of us have had them. And remember just how that is really so simple, but so unfathomable to so many other people. The government shouldn't be telling us what to do. The government shouldn't be protecting us from everything, you know, from, from the drugs and the porn or whatever. It, it, this, it, it, it's a complete worldview shift for a lot of people. And it's all encompassed in these words. It, it really was like, obviously not as important, but like a Declaration of Independence. It was a, a inspired people putting pen to some very basic ideas that were revolutionary in the, in the world of politics. Now, in exploring these words in Libertarian Party history in general, it's a work in progress. The same gentleman who came and spoke to me earlier said, you got something wrong in New Hampshire, and I love to hear that. I might get something wrong tonight, and if you know that bit of history that I've got wrong, please tell me, because then I'll, I'll, I'll incorporate it. It's always a work in progress, isn't it? And anything you all might want to tell me about history, I'll hear it. I love it. Now, this particular work, <coughs> I shouldn't have printed double-sided paper. It's totally confusing me. Um, this particular work on the origin of our party, I think, is long overdue. It actually shocks me that it really hasn't been done before. Now, it might have been, because as I said, we have terrible institutional memory, and for all I know, 20 years ago, there was another me running around doing this sort of thing, and it's been lost. But as far as I know, I'm the first person in a really long time to, to dig this deep into that. And I think part of it is when you're making history, you don't realize you're making history, so you don't write it down. And now we're a generation away, and we're about to lose our party history. The people back there in Colorado in the 1970s didn't think to preserve everything, because they're living it right then. It's boring. It's like looking at a picture of yourself you just took you know, five minutes ago, but you treasure it 40 years from now. And that's what I'm trying to recreate, and that's probably why it's been so long overdue. And when it comes to things like this, I've discovered that, at best, this part of history has been obscured. And at worst, I think it actually has been purposely misrepresented. But I think that's in, in the minority. So I do think we are quite literally in danger of losing exactly where we came from. Remind me. Please. And I didn't even put page numbers, so it's like, oh my god, get out. I did, okay. Well, I did on this one, okay. As you know, I'm a very informal speaker. You'll, have, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, participate in my internal dialogue. Now, at the time, remember, this was right in the Vietnam era, where people were being drafted. It was quite a politically volatile time. I think we're seeing that politically volatile time again after a certain period of relative peacefulness. So this is what came out of that. People were, were burning their draft cards. You know, They were upset about Nixon. And, and that's the soil that the Libertarian Party sprang from. And what they were trying to do was put forth an idea of radical individualism. And I know with all the party factional disputes that some of you might just get an itch, you know, if I say the word radical, it's not bad. It's not a bad word, neither is pragmatist. But it, we were a radical idea, and we remain a radical idea if you really, really understand what these words are saying. We're a radical revolutionary movement, a peaceful revolution, quite obviously, but if we ever lose the fact that we are a revolutionary idea, there's no way these ideas will ever succeed. So, where am I at now? Okay, so in the beginning, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. No, um, in the beginning, no one said, let there be nap. Uh, some party founders 
when the party started, were concerned about the arc of how political parties work. They were worried that entrenched issues would come in, there would be cults of personality, there would, you know how it goes, right? You know? I know we've never seen that, so they were so wrong, you know, there's no factions or anything like that. But they were concerned that might happen. And they were concerned that as that happened, that principles would be lost, or our principles would be watered down or traded in for a quick sugar high, for something we could get at the moment, while later on we realize we don't have anything. As I said, I come from an evangelical Christian background, so I do use a lot of biblical analogies. I'm not doing this to preach at you. Um, I do it just because that's, actually American culture is seeped in that, so just think of it as, as literature. And some of you may know that there, there's a story in the Bible where Jesus was talking to somebody who um, you know, wanted riches, and he said, what profits it a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And I think that is applicable to us. What profit does it do us if we win every race tomorrow, but we've lost our principles? Have we really won? Because actually, if we wanted to be winners, we could have all just backed Trump, couldn't we? We could have just backed him, and we could call ourselves winners right now. But would we have really won? Or would we have lost our soul? I think we, we know the answer to that one. So we, we need to keep that in mind. Okay, so there was a guy who's one of the original founders of the party named Lee Frank Robinson. Some of you might have had the pleasure of meeting him. He's one of the few left. We're losing those people. Unfortunately, as life does happen, they, they depart from us. Um, D. Frank, I hope, will be with us for a very, very long time to come. I had the pleasure of speaking with him, and he gave me a lot of insight because he was there in 1972. He was there at that initial convention. convention. And he told me how it came to be that we had a statement of principles to begin with. This is what they decided would protect us. This was our force field here. And they decided that to keep the party on track, I'm not saying keep the party pure. One thing I want to get in everyone's head right now, that the party actually does exist as a separate thing. It's not a person, obviously, but it is a separate thing that will live on after us. Like, there are people who started the party who aren't here anymore, but the party's still here. And I think sometimes we get too wrapped up in making ourselves coextensive with the party. So that if somebody tells you, well, you don't agree with the party on this issue, what they hear is you're a terrible, awful person and you shouldn't be in this party. And that should never be the impression that people get. The party has certain things <coughs> that it holds in its documents. That doesn't mean you have to. I would be really, really surprised if someone agreed 100%. I might be even a little scared if somebody believed 100%. So there's probably going to be things I say tonight you don't agree with. That's okay. You're your own person. The whole idea, I think, is that we are all have a common vision, and we might differ in some areas, but if you join together on a common mission, you, you will succeed in something. So I want to be clear, that even though I'm talking about these principles and blah, 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 that I, I'm not talking about purifying the party as in its membership, but the party itself does have an ideology, and we're, we're lying to ourselves if we pretend like it does not. So, what they decided to do, they called this embedding an article of faith. They embedded an article in faith in the party that, were to, that, that was to be embedded into the soul of the party, that could not be amended except with a super, super majority and, and most of us are familiar with at least super majorities, two thirds, right? Um, this could not be amended without a super, super majority and a super, super quorum. Most of us are not familiar with that issue. Um, I think they might have even made that up. But this was approved by the initial bylaws committee. You guys did bylaws earlier today, so you know. It was, a, it was actually, well, I'll tell you, we'll, 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 get, we'll get there. Uh, so as Robinson relates it, he knows that putting something into your founding documents that is nearly impossible to change is not quote unquote good parliamentary form because what it is is a group of people from the past binding us now. 
and that would be bad parliamentary form if the survival of the organization qua organization was important. That there always just be an organization called Libertarian Party, but it really wouldn't matter what it what it stood for. The founders realized that there was nothing magical about the party, it was the principles. That if a Libertarian Party existed a hundred years from now, but didn't espouse these principles, it was irrelevant, the party was dead. So that is what they were protecting, is the principles of the party. So I, I think it actually was good parliamentary form, and you know how we all feel about parliamentary form. It's weird. So, they determined it was appropriate for an existentially ideological organization, which we are. We're a political party, but we're also, we're different. We're an ideological organization. A lot of people don't know how to take that. A lot of people even in the party don't know how to take that or come to grips with that. So, David Nolan and the founding convention delegates, they, they were convinced this was a good idea. So, as Robinson told me, what they did was plant, I, I love, like, I love words, so I love these word pictures. He said, uh, our intent was to plant a rhetorical stake in the ground with a tether. The Statement of Principles, a terse one-page document declaring to all coming after us, this is the anchor and the lifeline. Do not tread too far from it or you may perish. If you stay close, you may eventually prosper for your efforts. I think we've kind of lost the art of that kind of speech now with the internet where everything has to be in Twitter, you know, Twitter language. That, that is just, we, we don't have the fiery rhetoric anymore the way like even our, our founders did. Not just the party founders, but the country's founders when you read some of the things that they said. So this is what they did in 1972. They passed a Declaration of Principles. It was originally called the Preamble, but it's the Statement of Principles. And they secured its survival by saying that it could only be amended, and I want you to really pay attention here because I want you to realize the gravity of this. They said that it could only be amended by a seven ace vote of registered delegates at a national convention. Now, let that sink in, because already you go, wow, seven ace, that's a lot. It doesn't just say a seven ace vote. It says a seven ace vote of registered delegates. That means everyone who was there, whether they were in the room or not. I can tell you at national convention, there isn't seven ace of all the delegates on the floor at any one time. So that was on purpose. This, this was a parliamentary speak for, hell no, you are not amending this. <laughs> Basically, it's impossible. Now, is it in theory possible? You know, if you all are like a Wayne's World fan to be like, yeah, pigs might fly out of my butt. Yeah, it's theoretically possible, but it's practically impossible. And that was their intent. Okay, so what they meant by that and what they intended by that is that if you can't at least get one ace of delegates at convention to stand up for our principles, then don't worry that that convention killed the party. It was dead a long time ago if you couldn't even find that one ace. And that vote would only be the formal declaration of its demise. And they really were that dramatic about it. But I think almost at any convention you could find one ace to do anything, even if just to be a little bit ornery. So, <laughs> I know, crazy, right? Uh, so, they realized, though, that what they were doing was basically taking a vault, putting the party inside it, locking it, and then throwing the key in the middle of the ocean. So, they said, but not so fast, you know, we're all here in Denver, it's 1972, we're all like, you know, high on liberty. Because pot wasn't legal then, so you know, I'm sure they were very law abiding. So they were high on <laughs> And they said, okay, let's chill. Let's chill for two years. We're going to come back to National Convention in 1974. Let's promulgate this out to the party. And let's see what they think about it. So for just the 1974 convention, it could be amended by two thirds, normal. And then after 1974, you know, that's when the seven ace is locked in. So they gave themselves a two-year cooling off period. Now, at the original 1972 convention, there were about 80. Oh, God, there were about 80 delegates. Now, I'm going to tell you something astounding. The statement of principles passed unanimously at the 1972 convention. I think this is the one and only time that anything ever passed unanimously at the convention. 
there wasn't anyone jumping up screaming, none of the above, which is, you know, Carol Carroll, where Harry must not have been, or Mark Montoni, he always gives the speeches for none of the above. So it passed unanimously, which is quite remarkable. Small convention, 80, but 80 libertarians to, to agree on anything. I, and if you're wondering how I know some of this stuff besides reading it, um, D. Frank Robinson had in his basement the recordings from the 1972 um, convention. And I've listened to them multiple times. And it's wonderful. It is just a spine-tingling experience. So I can tell you, they were not very agreeable. On there was that guy. You know that guy? He's still alive, I know, because I know that guy. But that guy was at that convention. But apparently they even got that guy to agree to the matter they locked him in the bathroom for the vote. They totally agree. And I wonder if maybe, maybe they did. Maybe they just threw all the ordinary people out of the room. So what happened in 1974 when they had the opportunity to say, whoa, there, back up that horse. That was not a good idea. So in 1974, they could have ditched the whole idea. They could have amended it to be softer. You know, they, they could have done any number of things. And they did do something. They did not keep it, they didn't leave it alone in 1974. But what they did is actually make it more strident. They made it more, quote, unquote, radical. And that, to me, is somewhat amazing as well. But we need to understand what happened in those two years between 1972 and 1974. Here's where some of you people could probably correct me on some history, but from what I'm pretty sure I understand, Murray Rothbard got involved right before 1974. So during those two years, the, the original party was founded mostly by Ayn Randians. There were a mixture, there was a lot of mixture of stuff, but it was very, very Brandian. And during those two years, because then Ayn Rand decided she hated the Libertarian Party and Libertarians and, you know, just smelly of these who smoke pot. So during those two years, we started pulling in other people. And we've started pulling in a lot of people of the anarchist persuasion. So when it came time in 1974 to come back to convention, there was a danger that the party would die at that convention. There was a danger of a really big split. And it was between the minarchists, and I, I hope we all know these definitions. If you don't, just tell me. It's, it's no big deal. And the anarchists. And they decided that it was really dumb to be fighting over these minor, minor things. And they came to an agreement on how they could peacefully coexist. And this is something that has been passed down to us that you might just have heard of, like, as, as a legend. Uh, most of us have heard of it and don't even know what it is. And it's called the Dallas Accord, because the convention took place in Dallas, so that's why they call it that. And as I said, people who are making history usually don't know it. Every once in a while, I have someone who comes to me and says, the words Dallas Accord don't appear in any documents for like 10 years after that. Of course not. Do, do you think at Custer's last stand, they knew that's what they were doing? <laughs> So it became known as the Dallas Accord later. At the time, they didn't realize they were, they, they were making history. So I'm really suspicious if I found it immediately afterwards called that. It would seem like some kind of setup, you know. So now I'm going to get back to my notes. Da, 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 da. We're going to our handout now. As you know, class is in session. Um, this is the fruit of some of my, my, my research. Now, if you go to your handout, figure one. <laughs> figure one, class. And I, I also joke, because I really wish we had mimeograph machines, because those of you who are old enough to remember them, you all would be really into these handouts right now. <laughs> Again. I just volunteer every single time to teach her to do that. And it wasn't because like I was such a good self-help. I just wanted to smell that kind of stuff. You younger people have no idea. You have no idea. Okay. Okay. Oh, the smell is you never forget it's heavenly. But okay. That was off tangent, off topic, whatever. Um, figure one is the nineteen seventy-two bylaws. And you don't need to like read it in depth, but you will see this is where the 7-Ace rule is in there. 
and it, it, it says the enduring importance of the statement of principles requires that it shall not be amended by a vote of less than seven eighths of the delegates at regular convention, except that at the 1974 regular convention only, it may be amended by a vote of two thirds. So this is what I told you about. Now here's the, you know the, the, the historical document. One, I always get yeah, what, what happens is I start going in different directions. As most of you know, I'm a paralegal. I used to do fraud cases, and that actually becomes important here because what I learned is what we call document uh, forensic document examination. Most people, you think of forensics, you're thinking of dead bodies and stuff like that. But it actually is just examining things that aren't people to see what they'll tell you. Because even though people think eyewitness testimony is always the best, it really isn't. Um, we, we view things through certain paradigms and we sometimes it's confirmation bias or, or whatever. A lot of people are <coughs> on eyewitness testimony. So as I started recreating this history, I did speak to people who were at these conventions. And there were some differing, differing remembrances. Nothing really off, off track, but they were a little bit different. So then I went to the documents, because the documents are static. Now, of course, my interpretation of the documents could be biased. But going to the documents is about the best you could get for an unbiased witness at the time. So that's why you've got these handouts and why I'm, I'm so interested in what actually the document said. Now, what's remarkable about this article is the article within the section of the bylaws is that it hasn't substantially changed in 40 years. That's another thing. If you've ever been on a platform committee or a bylaws committee, you know we just love to change things. We are, you know, solutions looking for problems, and damn it, we will find that problem so we can make our change. So this bylaw remaining pretty much the same is also just, I don't want to say miraculous because, you know, we're not dealing on that level, but it is remarkable. The only thing that's really changed about it is the deletion of the legacy language about the 1974 convention. I think it moved to a different part in the bylaws, but the content of it is substantially the same. And I, that, that to me is somewhat incredible. So, knowing that, knowing that the bylaws actually talks about the statement of principles, uh, anyone who claims, and I'm sorry if it's anyone in here, I'm not meaning to insult you, I'm hoping to educate you, um, anyone who claims that um, libertarian party libertarianism, and I say that specifically because we're not the be-all and all of libertarians, um, there are other traditions of libertarianism. In, in England, this is going to trigger some people, not England, but overseas, this will trigger some people. Libertarian socialism is a thing. It actually predates, it predates American libertarianism. But libertarian party libertarianism is an American thing. And it has its own particular ideology. So anyone who tells you, though, and I hear this all the time, you can't define libertarianism. You can't define libertarian party libertarianism. Anyone who says that, they're just wrong. They're absolutely and utterly wrong because our bylaws say so. And the bylaws are basically the definition of the party. Again, though, no, it doesn't mean you need to agree. You're just recognizing that the libertarian party does have a set set of ideologies. And people who say you can make it anything you want and that it's silly putty, that's just, at best, horribly mistaken. So in fact, it can be defined, and it's defined by the statement of principles. So, God, I'm never doing this again. So that's the benchmark. And you hear a lot of talk, and, and, and I like calling on people who I think aren't paying attention because they're on their phone. Um, Jill Hoffman. I know you have. I know you have. I just wanted to pick on you because Josh, where's Joshua? He's not in the room, so I can't pick on him. I can't pick on him. Oh, well, I'll get him in for that, you know. You take a nap, sometimes you lose your eyebrows. <laughs> yes. My mom taught me that. When she fight with my dad, she'd go, you have to go to sleep sometime. <laughs> so, yes. You got it now. Uh, so you hear talk about the Big Ten. I mean, I think for us that is like, it's become a buzzword. I'm not even sure we even know what we mean by that anymore. But you hear talk of the Big Ten. I'm in favor of the Big Ten. A lot of people don't think I am because I'm of the radicals, right? But I am in favor of the Big Ten. But the Big Ten isn't so big. I'm sorry, for you. 
I believe in the big tent, but the tent obviously isn't so big that it covers every single possible belief or we wouldn't be a unique party. It obviously doesn't cover, you know, a lot of the things Trump says, right? So there are boundaries to this tent. And what are these boundaries? It's the statement of principles. But I'll tell you, you don't have to agree with the whole thing. You just sometimes you're in the tent, and sometimes you might be up with some other friends. And that's okay, because staying in one place at one time, hanging out in a tent with a bunch of us, could probably drive you crazy. So that is okay. But the big tent of libertarianism has boundaries. Of libertarian party libertarianism has boundaries, and it's the statement of principles. Now, some of us may go outside those boundaries. I do. I don't, I don't agree with everything. I'm pro-life. But I recognize the party's not. And I'm okay with that. I just don't ever represent the party as agreeing with me. You guys can be wrong. That's fine. I'm okay with you being wrong. And I, that's fine. And you'll have your issue. I don't know what it is. You have your heresy. We all do, right? I, I think I have a few more, too. But that's the big one. And that's okay. That's okay to disagree with the party. You're not a bad libertarian. You shouldn't be thrown out. You shouldn't have a scarlet letter put on your chest. Just not a real libertarian. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to be as real as me, but you know. But uh, I like to get that through. We take this like so personally sometimes if someone says, well, I hate when, you should never say to somebody you're not a libertarian, that's terrible. You really should never say that. What I do if somebody says something that I think is outside, I go, that's not a libertarian idea. And if you just adopt that, you will depersonalize so many arguments. Because then people won't feel like their person is being attacked. It's an idea. And you can discuss ideas without it being personal. So I would be fine sitting pro-life. That's not a libertarian idea. I'm okay. I'm, that's good. I think it is. And we can argue about it. Well, let's stop saying people aren't libertarians. Just deal with ideas. Because we all have non-libertarian ideas. Even if you're a top daughter. You have some non-libertarian ideas. If you don't know what a top god is, that's at the top of the Nolan chart. When I first learned that the first time, I was like, that is cute. I like that. <laughs> so further protections were put into place. Now that we've got the whole idea about the statement of principles and the tent, um, further protections were put into place to challenge anything that might come against the statement of principles, such as a, a future platform plan, or a policy, or an action of the LNC. If it contradicts the statement of principles, it could be referred to the Judicial Committee. The Judicial Committee, when it was first formed in the party, the national one had one purpose, you had one job to do, it had one purpose, and that was to judge everything by the statement of principles. Now, it's attracted a lot, well, attracted, you know, it's gathered a lot of other functions like barnacles to it over time, but really its purpose was to protect the statement of principles. And sometimes I have to point that out because if anyone's familiar with the Oregon situation, you know a judicial committee there is dirty, dirty words. You don't say that. Um, and hopefully none of you know the Oregon situation. But I'm proud to say Oregon is rejoining a region. And they're, they're going to be in region one. Yeah, I'm very, very happy about that. <laughs> and actually getting on the LNC was because of Oregon. I saw it. I know I go off on tangents here. You're going to get to know me very well. Um, the, the night before, we talked about um, the role of the LNC and things like that. And I put primacy on the state parties, not the LNC. I got on the LNC to make sure that the LNC stayed in its place and uh, that the state parties kept the autonomy that they should have. And why did I even come to that conclusion was because of Oregon. And I saw what happened in Oregon, and I thought that could happen to Colorado. And that's why I got me LNC, to make sure it didn't happen to Colorado. And I guess to make sure it didn't happen to anyone else. You don't even need to know the particular situation except to know the LNC overstepped its bounds and intruded into, in my opinion, into state autonomy. And I really wish states would continue to claim their autonomy. You're not a satellite of national. You're not a satellite of national at all. So you're, you're your own independent organization, and you know, claim that, claim that. And when you do that, you won't be so worried about what Arvin says. You know? <laughs> I, I'm saying that realistically. You know, Be proud of, of your state party and don't exclude. LNC is supposed to be a bunch of bureaucrats, honestly. They're just supposed to take care of the budget, 
and put on a convention. Really, that's their only bylaws duties. The state parties, your state chair, who is your state chair should be way more important to you than who's the national chair. <laughs> so, back on track. We were talking about the Judicial Committee. And also, what a lot of people don't know, we talk, well, actually, this was on track. I'm, I'm, I'm pretending like I did that on purpose. There is some, I don't want to call it abridgment, because they, w w with the National Party and the affiliates, it's kind of like a marriage. And there are some agreements in a marriage, and they could be different in each one. There was some conditions of affiliation with the National Party. There are very few, but one of them is that your state must adopt the Statement of Principles. So, adoption of the Statement of Principles is an absolute requirement for affiliation. If any state party ever repudiated the Statement of Principles by our bylaws, they should be disaffiliated from the National Party. It's one of the few things that's like a pretty much automatic disaffiliation. Other than that, you guys are free to do an awful lot of things. Now, what's also funny, well funny, and kind of like, well it's funny to me, I find lots of things really funny that other people don't feel like that's really boring. But when they embedded the statement of principles in the bylaws, it wasn't even written yet. So here they are, they're talking about this statement of principles and, blah, 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 and you know, we, the document wasn't even written yet. But they knew they would have it. So then, you know, the bylaws committee wasn't told the platform committee was probably just like two seats over because, you know, we were really small then, probably just reached over and tapped on the shoulder and said, Pip. Pip Boyles, the uh, initial chair of the platform committee. Now you guys got to write a statement of principles, and this is how important it is. And they did. They wrote one. And it was awful. It wasn't that the content was awful. Is it, it read like a document written by committee. <laughs> and that can be really, really awful. It had no life. It was technically correct, but it was a snoozer. So they took it out to the convention floor and said, listen, this isn't working. Would any of you guys like to write it? We'll give you like about an hour. You know, maybe a couple teams of you go off by yourself or whatever. Come back and we'll hear all the proposals. And that's what they did. Now, figure two. I'm kind of skip this, but that's okay. Where I was talking about we can't, where you can't say with the, that there's no libertarian party libertarianism. Uh, read figure two. This is from our current bylaws, and this is what we're required. It says the the statement of principles affirms that philosophy upon which the libertarian party is founded. Okay, by which it shall be sustained, and through which liberty shall prevail. Which is why my talk is called "Through Which Liberty Shall Prevail." So that is the definition of what we believe. The statement of principles is in our bylaws, it's not optional. Anyway, and the statement of principles is always required to be in the platform. And if you look at figure three, that goes into the whole judicial committee thing that I was telling you guys about that shows that its purpose was to um, conform to the statement of principles. Oh, another thing. At convention, let's say there's, most people don't know this, I didn't know this in 2016 or I would have done an appeal myself, but um, most people don't know, if you're a delegate at convention and you think you guys as a group just passed something that contradicts the statement of principles, you get 10% of the delegates there to sign off on it and an immediate appeal is heard on the spot at the Judicial Committee. That's one of the protections. Same thing with any resolutions that might contradict the statement of principles. You can appeal that. So, just so you know, you have more power than you thought. Let's see. And here's the affiliate party thing, if you don't believe me, in figure five, now nah, figure six, this is where we wanted to get to. So, a bunch of people went out of the room and they wrote a certain number of proposals. And they came in and uh, read them aloud. Now this is one thing that I do know. So if you see in figure six is all the various proposals that were, I actually think that stopped taping and you're just sitting here like this. So that's okay. Uh, screw it. Who cares? Um, <laughs> I'm looking at it going, huh, interesting. So 
this is something, what you are reading here in your pamphlet actually is quite exhilarating because those 72, 1972 tapes were lost for a really long time. And when we converted them, one of the first things I did was transcribe this portion of the, the, the original ones that were given. These weren't noted anywhere and probably haven't been seen since that time until I transcribed them. So you could view what could have been the various contenders for our statement of principles. And some of them are quite, I'm trying to think of a word. Well, yeah. Some of them were just quite, quite. Um, <laughs> just be, be glad. Uh, if you read a lot of Ayn Rand, you would think you were reading out of John Galt's speech with some of these. I mean, it is so Randian. With like, I think one of them says, "Man is not a sacrificial animal." You know, that's directly from Ayn Rand, and that's nice for the time. But I think afterwards, it was just a little. A little too much, a little matchy matchy, as you know, fashion people would say when they're all monochrome. So, but it's cool to read them, correct? And the one that was chosen was John Hosper's version. As most of you know, John Hosper's was our first uh, presidential candidate. He got an electoral college, electoral college vote along with Tony Nathan. So when everyone, you know, when the Hillary thing was going around, how she's going to be the first woman to get an electoral college vote. No, she wasn't. Tony Nathan was. The Libertarian Party was the first party to ever have a woman get an electoral college vote. And also, quite likely, the first party that had a, a, a gay man get an electoral college vote because Mr. Hospers was gay. Now, openly, that's disputed because, you know, things were different in the 70s. It was quite dangerous to, we take for granted today that you could just be yourself. It wasn't that way in the 70s. But I think we could take great pride in that, that our first ticket got an electoral college vote and it was a gay man and a woman. And I think that is just absolutely fantastic and archetypal of what we stand for. So John Hospers wrote the original statement of principles. If none of you have ever watched any old tapes by John Hospers, you should. He's one of those people that just had a melodious voice. And literally, and now I know you guys are going to think I'm a big, 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 big geek more than you've got already. Well, I'm listening to the 1972 tapes and the people getting up and reading their proposals. The last one to get up was John Hospers, and he gets to the mic. And I'm listening to the tape, and I've got to be careful that I don't do it right now. Because I'm like a real emotional person. So he, he, he gets to the tape, and he starts reading it. And I'm sitting at home with my headset on, listening to John Hospers over the 40 years of time come back and just say, okay, here's my proposal. And John Hospers, a wonderful voice, gets up and says, we, the members of the Libertarian Party. You know, and I, I cried. I literally did. When I was, it was just... My hair stood on end here. Not this hair. That would have been kind of cool. Um, but it, that, it affected me that deeply. His voice reading it for the first, you realize that was the first time those words were said out loud. And I think of that when I stand up in front of you guys and read them out loud. I, I think of John Hospers in 1972 getting up and reading those words out loud. So his proposal was, in fact, adopted. And thank you. And what I ha oh, I've got a treat for you guys. You're going to be the first one. Oh. <laughs> Statement of principles. All right. So if you look, I just threw it on the ground. I'll pick it up afterwards. Um, if you look on page 10, you'll see this typewritten document with some handwritten writing on it. This has been a photocopy that had been floating around for years. Nobody really knew where it came from. Um, and it was like a really crappy photocopy. You know, like when photocopy machines probably like took 10 minutes to like spit out one of these and it was bad. Um, and it was on that curly paper probably. Uh, but this had been floating around and I was just thrilled to have this. I'm like, oh my God, a photocopy of what he wrote down at that time. That is so fantastic. So I am going to go off on a tangent here a bit. But I hope this adds a lot of color. So anyone who's heard this before knows now it's different. And Joe can pay attention because this didn't happen in New Hampshire. Um, I happened to be browsing eBay one day. And I don't normally look for political stuff on eBay. I look for shoes. And I look for dresses. Um, and occasionally Beanie Babies. But uh, I happened to look and said, well, it's cute. Let me see what they have in Libertarian Party stuff. Just curious. I didn't even think really they'd have anything. 
And I'm sitting there, and this is me now, you know, with the statement of principles person. I make the joke that I would tattoo it on my ass, but my ass isn't that big right now. Now, it was. I lost 50 pounds. I probably should have done it then. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just sitting here through eBay scrolling, and I'm like, I see this listing that purports to be the original document that was the statement of principles from John Hospers. No, come on. Now the one day I'm checking and I'm looking at it and I got out my photocopy because I had a photocopy of it and I'm like, this is genuine. It's the same handwriting. I had a coffee stain on it. It didn't have a mess copy. But, and who knows, it could just been too late to be on here. And I'm like, that is genuine. Where the hell has this thing been for four years? And I got together all my geeky friends and we all like started watching it and bidding on it. You know, so we would keep bidding and bidding and bidding. And it got up to like $450. And one of my friends was still the high bidder. And then like at the last minute, it got sniped. I think it sold for $475, somewhere around there at the last minute. I cannot tell you the heartbreak. I cannot tell you the wailing and gnashing of teeth. But we comforted ourselves knowing that somebody who paid that much for it at least probably would take good care of it. And it existed. And maybe one day we would see it. And we lived with that so we lived with that for a few weeks maybe a week and then another friend of mine sends me a private message on Facebook oh by the way I'm the one who sniped that at the last minute we're like damn it we probably, that thing probably would have sold for the original 100 bucks but it was all my friends bidding against each other on the $475 but we ended up with the document and you know he see that the low row was out of Washington and he bought it and he, when it came in the mail he was like oh my god it came in this flimsy envelope and I had a heart attack or whatever so he called the seller because now he had her contact information and was like where did you get this and it turns out that she's the daughter some of you may know of the Gottliebs the Gottliebs were initial movers and shakers in the Libertarian Party of California, one of the initial people. And she told Well how she remembers John Hospers being in their home. You know, it was when the party was first started. And her parents had recently passed away. And she was having to dispose of their material effects. And when she was in their home, she saw on the wall was hung a picture of Ayn Rand. But it wasn't just a picture of Ayn Rand. It was like it was like a shitty photocopy, co like this was, a black and white of Ayn Rand. Like, why in the hell would anyone frame that? Like, it was just a big blob, and she's just like, maybe, you know, they're getting a little, you know, not all there or something towards the end. So she took it down, and when she took it down, she wanted to keep the frame, I think, actually. So she, she took the picture out, and behind it, she found the original copy of the Statement of Principles, and that's where it's been for four years, apparently. And it sounds like a fiction story, doesn't it? But it's exactly what happened. But what didn't, I think I told the story in New Hampshire, but what I didn't do in New Hampshire is I brought it with me, because I'm, like, so, like, thrilled by this. Oh, God, I did such a own case. And uh, afterwards, I'll have it out there. You can all come take a look at it. But if you look at that photocopy and you see this, it is, in fact, that document. This is a document that was at the 1975. It's in somewhere. Don't know when that happened. But everything on it is completely genuine. So th this was there when our party was born. And this is the typewriter of John Hospers. That might not thrill you as much as it thrills me, but oh my God, it's just like, uh, I, I, I have a bit of woo, you know, where like I see signs and stuff, you know, not super safe, but like I think there's a higher power that God, this kind of thing. Um, so it's just so odd, at least, and you, even if you don't have woo like I do, you will admit at least it's odd that after all those years, and the one person who is obsessed with the statement of principles just happens to be looking on eBay that day, is the one that gets it and has it in her hands right now. It's absolutely incredible. And throughout this process of uncovering the party history, again, woo, I have felt like some of the early people have been guiding me. 
Um, it's been actually quite strong. There's another story I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about with it later. I had this dream of this really long conversation. I had the data goal on this very interesting. But. So afterwards, you can come in and take a look. This will also be in NOLA at the historical table. And then it's going home to the home office. So after its journey in the wilderness, like the Israelites for 40 years, it's now coming home. It's coming home and it will be where it should have been, hanging in our office. And to me, it means more than I could possibly say to be the person to facilitate this. So let's put that back down there. So now we're back to, oh, Lordy, I got another pair. See, I moved that back. I don't know where it went. Oh, there they go. Oh, so terrible. All right, so statement of principles. There's your original that you have uh, the story. So that is the original that they adopted, then in 1974 it changed. Because if you look at this, and then you look at this or the copy you have in your hand, yeah, because it's all cursive, it's different. It's not exactly the same. It's almost the same, but it's not exactly the same. And here's where we come to the really, really important part, now that I've given you all the background. But I hope you found the background interesting. So. Figure 13 is the 1972 Statement of Principles written by John Hospers that was passed. Interesting bit of trivia, though, that on that, where there's some handwritten version, the original Statement of Principles mentioned copyright and affirmed it. I know that's going to trigger a lot of people, but it got crossed off, so apparently maybe that is what they are debating about to get the, but it did originally mention patents and copyrights. I just thought that's a, a, an interesting bit of history. One thing I'll find about with me in history, I don't care whether it, it um, supports my narrative. I'm into history for its own sake, and history is dirty and ugly and messy, and it's never entirely clear, and you're going to find contradictory things. You're going to find things you don't like, that you wish weren't there, but they're there. And contrary to where I don't shred those documents, I do actually save them, even if I don't like them. Um, so, 1972 Statement of Principles. Figure 14 is the 1974 Statement of Principles. Again, yeah. first glance, I mean, same number of paragraphs, looks like about the same number of words, looks the same. But, page 13, and I don't know before me, maybe somebody did, but as far as I know, no one else had ever gone through this exercise. I compared the two to figure out exactly where it changed. There are some changes that everyone knew about, like I added the odd phrases of governments when they exist and existing governments. And most people think that is the, the, the change, and the important change. It's the, it was the compromise between the monarchists and the anarchists. But actually, that change is minor. I used to think that was the important change. It isn't. There is actually an even more important change. But what I did, I color-coded all the changes for you, because I'm a barely going to have OCD. And the blue ones are style and grammar changes. The green ones where we were very far seeing where it used to say men and he and that sort of thing. It was changed to gender neutral expressions. Uh, purple is substantive but other changes. For instance, the last part used to talk about laissez-faire capitalism and it got changed to the free market. We could argue for days about why that happened. I tend to think it's because most people don't know what that meant. Um, and free market is Easy, easy to understand. But the yellow is where we're going to concentrate on. The yellow is the Dallas Accord changes. Now, what's important about that, and even if you read, read the Wikipedia article, I suggest you don't because it's terrible. Um, but if you do, <laughs> Wikipedia won't let me edit the, stop me from editing the Statement of Principles article because a lot of the material I was setting was my own material it's because it's kind of like my area of expertise. So basically, Wikipedia said, basically, you can't be the expert in it and write out, like, okay, fine, we'll just never come back here. The good articles on Wikipedia. One on Wikipedia is terrible. And you'll see where they They threw me off, I think. I don't know. They just told me I didn't want them on. I'm fine. Um, if you talk to people about the Dallas Accord, or you read about the Dallas Accord, the thing you'll mostly hear is that it was informal. That it was an informal handshake agreement between those people in 1974. And while that's interesting, nice bit of history, that it has absolutely little to no bearing on today. Because it was only binding be between those people then. It was never anything in writing. 
it was just, hey, you know, probably a bunch of drunk libertarians that just agreed on something. <laughs> and that actually is where the astonishing part to me comes in. That's absolutely and utterly false. In the technical terms, it's bullshit. It, in fact, was codified. And what you're looking at, when you look at these yellow sections, is you are looking at the Dallas support. So anyone who tells you it wasn't ever put in writing just doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. Now, was all of it put in writing? No. There were some, there were some side agreements that weren't. But the part that was, was by editing the most important document in our party. It was by editing it in 1974, when you could do it by two-thirds, realizing that after they did this, it was impossible to edit again. The 70s rule got locked down after this happened. That's how important it is. And we almost lost that, that part of our history. So don't let anyone tell you that there was nothing formal about it. There were some informal things. But the formal stuff's here in the Statement of Principles, in our most important document. So you should be wondering, what did they change? You got me curious, right? What did they change? Do we now all have to sacrifice our firstborn sons to Ayn Rand? No, we don't have to do that. <clears throat> at ease as far as that goes. And this is where uh, forensic document examination, my skill set, comes into place. Until somebody did that, you really, you really couldn't see what the changes were, but the document doesn't, the document doesn't lie. Let's see where we are at. Okay. Excuse me, because I did go way off. So when I tell people that the Dallas Accord was in fact formalized, I get a lot of incredulous looks, and, and it doesn't surprise me because legend has said otherwise. And who am I? Someone who's been in the party less than four years come along telling you that all that is wrong? Yeah, because, you know, if you have a source from history that gets repeated by 70 people, that doesn't make it 70 sources. It makes it one source repeated 70 times. So just because that idea that it wasn't written down in any form has been repeated a bunch of times doesn't mean anything. Probably came from one person that said that who didn't know what they were talking about. So the multiplicity is of original witnesses. That's where the forensic document examination comes into play. So I decided to go look at the documents and can I prove my, my uh, absolutely uh, scandalous claim that the uh, statement of it, that the Dallas Accord was in writing? And I can. It's this document that proves it for me. Unless there is an alternative. There is an alternative. The Dallas Accord, which talked about peace between the minarchists and the anarchists, happened in 1974. No one disputes that. And the Statement of Principles was amended in 1974 to create peace between the party anarchists and the minarchists. And they were completely unrelated. That's the only other thing that you could So you don't believe that this is somehow related to that discussion since it's on the exact same topic, or do you just believe it just happened to happen at the same time? Again, we can start talking about pigs flying up butts again, because it is, it is in fact what happened. The, the documents are not lying. The documents are very clear. So it's to those amendments we will now look at. And I wasn't the I'm sorry. Here we go. Now, I want to draw your attention. So, it is important to actually look at this at this time. In, 1930, in 1972, one of the yellow changes that were made here in yellow, the 1972 Statement of Principles said, the sole function of government is protection of the rights of each individual. That sounds innocuous enough, doesn't it? I mean, even I, most of you know, I am a party anarchist. I could agree to that, I think. Uh, but they apparently in 1974 had a cow and they couldn't. Um, maybe I hear, it depends. You know, I could do a lot of words, you know, a lot of, you know, crossing my fingers behind my back and a lot of word games. And I, I could probably agree with that. And it also said government has only one legitimate function, the protection of individual rights. That's what it said in 1972. Now, 1974, the current version, this is what it says. Where governments exist, they must not violate the rights of any individual. And governments, when instituted, must not violate individual rights. So it's pretty apparent what happened right there. It made government optional. It, made, it gave a nod to anarchists. 
fact is, the statement of principles is 90% a minarchist statement with a couple nods, wink, wink, to, to anarchists. Uh, but it did. It, it, it made the state or government optional. And that's pretty striking. And most people know that. But as I said, that isn't the most important change. There was a subtle but more profound change that was also made. And that will become important when we start talking about the relationship, if we do, because I have no idea. Somebody better to keep in time and tell me when to shut up or take questions or whatever. Uh, an additional change was, was made. And what it did is the net, we, we libertarians are familiar with the terms positive and negative as in rights. Most of you here understand the concept of negative rights. Libertarians believe in negative rights. We don't believe in positive rights. Negative right would be your right to life. A positive right would be your right to health care. A negative right is something that you have without anybody having to do anything to give it to you other than not aggress against you. So that's a good, quick and dirty, but negative and positive has always been a big distinction in, in libertarianism. Now the 1972 Statement of Principles assigned a, po a positive role to the government. The government should do something. The government should do this. The government should do that. In 1974, it flipped it on its head and took out all of the positive roles for government and only put in negative roles. The government must not do this, and the government must not do that. That is a far more important change than the where existing and all that other stuff. And that is really where the Dallas Accord lies. That in order for, let's say you're a minarchist, I don't know if you already have, and we're going to debate, according at least to the statement of principles, the only thing we have to debate about is does this violate rights? Because initially the 72 statement of principle says the government should protect rights. The 1974 statement of principle says the government must not violate rights. There's a, there's a difference there. And that actually is the argument, isn't it? It's a very subtle argument. It, the minarchy anarchy just is so stupid because it really just comes down to like tiny, like, oh my God, tiny, ooh, excuse me, tiny, 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 tiny little things. But it all comes down to violating rights. Does a state that takes a monopoly on the protection of your rights, is that a violation of rights in and of itself? That's the debate right there. Done. That's the debate. And the party itself decided we're not going to take a position on that. That will be reserved to when it's relevant. It's not relevant. So the party, as we talked about, the party having its own beliefs, I personally am an anarchist. The party itself is agnostic. The party takes no position on the end game. It's not like they're delusional and don't recognize we have a government now that we need to deal with whether we like it or not. But the end game, the ideal, libertopia, they take no position on whether or not the state should or should not exist. And that is the truce that happened in 1974. And I believe it's that same agreement that will keep us going. And if we came back to recognizing that, would solve a lot of the factional problems in the party. And that is another driving motivation behind me doing this. When it comes down to these debates, everyone can win right now. We are so far from that being relevant that there is no reason we can't all be happy. And anyone that is so like, we agree on all this, but unless the party says you anarchists are wrong, then blah, 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 blah. It's like, and, and, unless it concedes that I'm absolutely right, then there's something wrong. Why are we even having this? Ridiculous, as far as I'm concerned. But that is now, and it's not optional, by the way. It's not optional for you and I to be like, this, the, the party takes no position on it because it's in here. The one thing that's not optional is the statement of principles. And it takes no stand. It's agnostic. Though, in my most honest moments, it is primarily a minarchist document. But it carves out that little point of acceptance of people who want to go further. So anytime anyone's looking to purge one way or the other, because I know there's a bunch of asshole anarchists too, please. I know that. I, they're, they're my people. I know that. But so when there's purgy, purgy tendencies in either way, it's, it's completely misguided. Now, what was the informal part of the statement of principles? And there's where a lot of dis disputes come in. And it'll be a presentation for another day, because I found my next research project, actually my next two. 
It was, what would the platform say? Now, uh, one thing I want you to understand about the platform. The platform isn't actually, I don't want to say it isn't what we believe, because it is, but it isn't, five minutes left, oh my God. Okay, it isn't actually what our end game is. The platform was always intended to be transitional, to, to say steps along the way. And unfortunately, a lot of us today will look at the platform and think it states our end game. It doesn't say we're against all taxation, does it? It only says we're against income tax. Hey, it actually does say we're against all taxation. But let's pretend it didn't. That doesn't matter. The platform was meant to be things we could accomplish now. It wasn't to say things like, we want sea setting and colonies on the moon or whatever. There was some point I think it did say that. But that was never the intent of it. The statement of principles is the end game. The platform is the transition state. And I can prove that easily. Go read the preamble. The last sentence of the preamble says, the, the policies and the planks that follow are not our goal. That's right. Our goal is nothing less than a world set free in our lifetime, and it's to this end that we take these stands. So arguing over the platform, and someone comes to the platform to me, because they do, you know, it's an anarchist, and it says here, and it's another man, I'm like, of course it does. We're, we're not delusional. But that doesn't mean that the party saying the government has to exist. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. We're not, we're not where it's relevant yet. So I'm um, ending on what I was told wasn't originated by Harry Brown, but it was popularized by Harry Brown. And it is the train analogy that I know a lot of people think is trite. But I actually think no analogy is going to walk on all fours, you know, but libertarians will go, but what if, no, let's keep it simple. The way the Libertarian Party, this is the Big Ten, we're a directional party as far as its membership. Our documents are destinational. This is the destination. But our membership is supposed to be directional, meaning, are you and I going in the same direction? Great, let's keep doing that until we're not anymore. And that's the train analogy. Where we're, if you're looking at the Nolan chart, we're all on a train going northward. And there's going to be some point where some of us want to get off. A little further, you know, maybe some people are into public schools. So at the point where that would be on the plate to abolish the platform does say that. I know Marvin hasn't been the greatest messenger of that. Then that's where you depart. On good terms. We can be co-warriors until we can't be anymore and we wish each other well. And allegedly, people like me will take it all the way to the end and get off then. But who knows? There might be a stop along the way that I go, that looks pretty damn good. And you, and you get off there. And we have to keep this spirit alive. But I have to tell you, there is a movement in the party that actually denies that. That says that we really aren't going in the same direction. That it's like two trains, one's going to New York and one's going to California. Well, if you're going to parse it out that way between the anarchists and the anarchists, well, what about between the classical liberals and the anarchists? Are they like a train going to, you know, Colorado? How far would you, you're going to start parsing it out until, again, it's going to be a train that only has you on it and you're the caboose because you're being a big ass. Right? So, Words. If I skip all the way out to the end, God did not get my whole taxation. Um, just remember that. Oh, God. I'm going to do it by memory. As we go forward, just remember what our bylaws say about our foundational document. It says it's the principles upon which the party was founded, through which it shall be sustained and through or by, by which it shall be sustained, and through which liberty shall prevail. If we keep our eye on that, we, we will prosper. And if we, as long as we don't murder ourselves, you know, in, in, in the interim. So that is my goal. That's why I call myself a bit post-factional now. But I think we can all win while we're while accepting that there are certain principles. But hey, I can disagree. You know, we're libertarians, right? So that's what history has shown me. I hope this gives you some insight into how our party was founded. And I think it does give us some insight as to how we can move forward in unity still. So don't try to throw them now. Get rid of the purgy instincts. And let's, let's keep, our, keep our eye on the prize of a world set free in our lifetimes.
Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.